Hi, thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm Leona Lassak from the Ruhr University in Bochum, and I'll be presenting work on the FIDO2 WebAuthn protocol we did together with the University of Chicago and the Max Planck Institute. Specifically, I'll introduce you to our user-centered research surrounding misconceptions with biometric WebAuthn and also how to mitigate them. Okay, so first, Imagine on your phone, you sign into a website, let's say eBay, and the following notification pops up. It reads, tired of passwords? If you use your fingerprint, face, or PIN to sign into your phone or tablet, you can now use it to sign into eBay. Initially, that sounds pretty nice, right? But it might also be scary to be sending your fingerprint to eBay or other websites. Even though this is not what is actually happening with WebAuthn, a first-time user might think that. This idea that you can use your biometrics to sign in to websites is part of the FIDO Alliance's FIDO2 project, specifically a protocol called WebAuthn, which is short for Web Authentication. The main goal of the FIDO Alliance's project is to replace passwords for authentication on the web, so signing into websites, and apart from biometrics, which I already talked to you about, you can also, for example, use your phone's unlock pin or a security key like a Google Titan or a YubiKey. Behind the scenes, WebAuthn is based on public key cryptography, but let's have a closer look at that. If the user with their device wants to register on a website, say Google or eBay, Microsoft, you name it, the main thing that happens is that a public-private key pair is created. And the private key is then stored on the user's device. The public key, on the other hand, gets stored by the website. The user is now registered without having any password. A few days later, you might come back and you want to sign into your eBay account. The first thing that happens then is that the website sends a so-called challenge to the user's device. This challenge then needs to be signed with the private key that is stored on the user's device. So what happens when the user provides their biometrics to the device is that they authorize the use of the private key to sign the challenge that the website had sent. Once the challenge is signed, it is transmitted back to the website, which can verify it using the public key it stores. So what is essential here to understand is that the biometric data never leaves the user's device. So your fingerprint or face recognition data only stays on your device. The website does never see it. Okay, that sounds pretty nice so far. Let's summarize the main advantages of WebAuthn. In general, we can say, especially with biometric WebAuthn, it is very fast and also convenient to use. Unlike with passwords, there's also nothing to remember. And from a security perspective, the protocol provides not only phishing resistance, but it's also protected against password reuse or credential stuffing attacks. So overall, we think that WebAuthn with biometric holds great potential to replace passwords on the web, which is also what motivated our research and the focus on biometric authentication within the FIDO2 project. But let's take a short step back. You just saw all the inner workings of WebAuthn, especially where the biometrics are stored and that it never leaves the device. However, a first-time user does not have all that information and has only ever seen something like this. We call such a screen a notification. So when such a notification screen pops up on the user's screen, as I also demonstrated to you in the beginning of this talk, all the user knows is that they can now sign into eBay or other websites using their fingerprint or face. Now you might ask, why is this notification screen so important? Well, in order to actually replace passwords on the web, we will have to convince users to switch to using WebAuthn. And most of the users are going to be making this decision simply based on a notification screen similar to the one I am showing you. 
So essentially, the notification is what decides whether or not a user is going to switch from their password to WebAuthn. And as you might have already guessed, these notifications were the focus of our studies. So what did we do? Overall, we were curious to learn what users expect when they log in with their fingerprint, whether they have misconceptions or concerns. So we conducted three interrelated studies. The first one allowed us to identify misconceptions with the help of 42 participants. Based on those misconceptions we found in study one, we then conducted our second study, where we held seven focus groups with 29 participants. In those focus groups, together with the participants, we designed small notifications to help avoid the misconceptions and more accurately convey the security and usability properties of biometric web of N. Lastly, in our third study, we had 345 participants for an online experiment in which we assigned each person a specific way of logging in and a notification to compare the notifications that had been designed in study two. Let's have a closer look on study one. We asked participants to use their biometrics with the WebAuthn protocol to sign into our website. And afterwards, they completed a survey about what they thought was happening, which let us identify user understandings, perceptions, and also the misconceptions about biometric WebAuthn. When first visiting the website, participants saw this simple notification before they were asked to register. It said, depending on your device, you can sign in with your fingerprint, face or iris. So it's a very generic message. During the registration, they then saw the native WebAuthn verify your identity screen, which is dependent on the operating system of the user's device. We then proceeded with some survey questions covering everything from perceptions of usability and security to quantifying potential misconceptions. After one week, we then had participants return to log in to the account and afterwards answer some more survey questions. Okay, what did we learn? First of all, we found that unfortunately, 67% of participants incorrectly believed that their biometric data leaves the phone and would be transmitted to our website or even a third party. 43% of participants thought that their biometric data would not be safe from an attacker who might steal data from the website's database, which is obviously rooted in the thought that the biometric data is already stored on the website's database which, as you know, is not the case. Participants also raised a number of usability concerns, especially what would happen if they can't log in with their fingerprint. It makes sense that people do not realize that they could use PIN or password as a fallback mechanism, because that is nowhere shown in the notification or the other screens the user sees when logging in with WebAuthn. Hence, it is also unsurprising that more than 90% of participants were unaware of the possibility to use the non-biometric fallback of the phone in case the biometric fails. However, the fact that the fallback is actually available with WebAuthn, but users are unaware of it, highlights the necessity to address those misconceptions, unawarenesses and concerns early on because otherwise they might hinder the adoption of WebAuthn. Okay, so now that we've learned from study one that lots of people don't know what happens to their biometrics when they are using FIDO2 WebAuthn, we then wanted to design better notifications. For that, we adopted a technique called co-design focus groups, where non-expert end users work together with us to create notifications that they thought were understandable. We also instruct them to focus their notifications on the key points they thought are most important to know surrounding WebAuthn. But let me give you some background information on the focus group technique. 
We adopted it because involving end users can contribute very valuable insights on issues that experts might be unaware of. The end users can also challenge implicit assumptions and preconceptions the researchers might have. So the technique helps to develop notifications that actually fit the end user's understanding by including end users during the development process. Overall, our second study spent a vastly unrealistic amount of time explaining how WebAuthn works to ensure that participants were able to identify the information they thought was most relevant for a short screen-sized notification. In order to ensure this sound understanding, after welcoming the participants, we presented them a short video which showed the basic functionality of Biometric WebAuthn. So it, for example, showed that you can use your fingerprint to sign into a website. After that, we collected their very initial impressions on what they had just seen and proceeded with providing supplementary reading which explained the inner workings of WebAuth and in detail, and also gave some background information on the protocol. After that, we headed into the main part of the study, which was the notification design task. We asked participants to develop their own notification, which would fit on a phone screen. And they were also instructed to include what was most relevant to them personally, and to create a supplementary drawing that would go along with their notification. Two examples of such drawings can be seen in the slide I'm showing you. We included the drawing task because we wanted to identify whether there might be visuals that can go along with a text notification that help users to understand what we want to convey to them. We ended the study with a discussion where we sort of summarized and commented on the other participants' notifications and discuss the most crucial points that should be included in any notification. Okay, so overall, we found that participants focused on information from four different categories. The first one is what we call convenience. And here participants mentioned how fast and easy it is to use biometric WebAuthn. In the security category, General terms like safe and secure were mentioned frequently, but participants were also more specific by emphasizing the storage location of the biometric data by, for example, saying that it is only stored on your device, that it never leaves your phone, or that no one except you has access to the biometric data. We also identified a third point in the security category, which was a rather controversial point surrounding whether it might be good or not to mention that WebAuthn is co-developed by brands like Google or Apple. On the one hand, participants thought that these companies might serve as a trust anchor by being well-known popular brands. But on the other hand, other participants thought that these companies were rather untrustworthy or that they would not encourage them to use WebAuthn. The third category we identified was a comparison to passwords. Some participants emphasized, for example, that there is no need to remember a password anymore or that passwords are easy to hack, which is not the case for biometric WebAuthn. The last category we call availability, where participants pointed out that it might be important to mention that you cannot easily access your account from a different device unless you specifically register it. Now that we have learned what to include in a notification, we wanted to compare the different notifications in our third study. Similar to study one, we had people register and authenticate with biometric WebAuthn and answer some survey questions. However, in this study, we randomly assigned participants to one of eight groups that specified how they would register and authenticate, as well as which notification they would see. Don't worry if this sounds a little confusing at this point, we will now have a closer look at those different conditions in study three. 
Six groups in total registered using biometric WebAuthn. One of these groups saw what we call the control notification. It just has the heading fast and easy sign in with your fingerprint or face and is, as you might have already noticed, inspired by the convenience category we identified in our second study. The other five biometric notifications all have the same heading and then add more information, which I'm going to show you now. The notification we call stored adds that your fingerprint or face is only stored on your personal device. Shared says that the biometric is never shared with Example Tech, which was our research website, or third parties. In the least notification, we emphasize that the fingerprint or face never leaves your personal device. And in the hacked notification, it mentions that unlike passwords, biometric WebAuthn can't be hacked. Lastly, brands refers to the controversial point I mentioned by saying backed by Microsoft, Google and Apple. As already mentioned, we also had two more conditions. The non-biometric notification said that it is a fast and easy sign-in with your device's PIN, pattern or password. And lastly, we had participants who just signed in with a regular site-specific password. So what did we find? We asked our participants how secure they perceived the login they had just performed. The shades of green in the top of this graph are people who felt secure using the login they did and red at the bottom represents those who did not feel secure. The two bars on the right represent the non-biometric WebAuthn with pin or pattern and the site-specific password. And what we find is that these are the two conditions that participants rated least secure. The biometric method was perceived as more secure than the non-biometric methods, which is an encouraging result regarding the participants overall willingness to adopt biometric WebAuthn. In the biometric condition, we also had a within subjects comparison of all the different notifications to see which one was perceived best and to get more feedback on them overall. Here we found that the stored and leaves notification made the participants feel most secure. So saying fingerprint or face is only stored on your personal device or mentioning that fingerprint or face never leave the personal device seems to leave participants feeling more secure. We began this presentation talking about misconceptions. So let's have a look at those again. In our control condition, which only mentioned that biometrics is fast and easy, 66% had the misconception that the biometrics were sent to the website. Fortunately, the notifications stored and leaves, which let the participants feel most secure using biometric WebAuthn, also were able to address the misconceptions to some part. After seeing the stored or leaves notifications, only 45% or 50% had the misconception that the biometrics were sent to the website. Even though this is an improvement, we do acknowledge that there is still a long way to go and that the misconceptions are definitely not fully addressed by those notifications. Let's summarize what we have learned in this talk. We found that there are misconceptions surrounding where the biometrics is stored with biometric WebAuthn. Nevertheless, the login is perceived highly positively and users indicate that they would be happy using biometric WebAuthn, which is an encouraging result for deploying WebAuthn with biometrics and for the potential adoption by end users. We would particularly recommend using notifications that emphasize where the biometrics are stored and that they never leave the user's device. It is also important to emphasize the speed and ease rather than comparing biometric WebAuthn to passwords. This brings us to the end of this talk. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'll be very happy to answer any of your questions.